let's imagine that we are looking at a very small section of the axon and paying attention to the behavior of the voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. To keep track of what's going on, let's have a small plot that illustrates the membrane potential and the conductances for each ion as a function of time for the small subsection of the axon. All right. Assuming that for whatever external reason the neuron gets excited and the membrane potential increases, it will have the effects of gradually opening the voltage-gated channels through the voltage-gated sensors. Because of the intrinsic properties of the voltage-gated sodium channel, it will open faster to its maximal capacity relative to the voltage-gated potassium channel and thus let sodium enter first in the cell. As the conductance of the sodium channel increases, the entry of positively charged sodium further depolarizes the cell and pushes the membrane potential up to the equilibrium potential for sodium. This depolarization phase caused by sodium, more commonly referred to as the rising phase, is then stopped by three factors. First, as we've discussed, the driving force on sodium becomes much less because the membrane potential approaches the equilibrium potential for sodium very closely and hence the sodium has less of a drive to enter the cell. Secondly, the sodium channels progressively inactivate, which causes the conductance of the sodium channels to gradually decrease. Finally, the delayed voltage-gated potassium channels now open at maximal conductance and start repolarizing the cell towards the equilibrium potential of potassium. As the membrane potential goes back to the resting value, the potassium channel closes and its conductance decreases as well. Note that potassium channels do not open at the peak of the potential, they open earlier around at the negative 20 millivolts range. For terminology's sake, the repolarization is known as the falling phase and the peak of the action potential is known as the overshoot. You will notice that the hyperpolarization by potassium pushes the potential below the resting membrane potential. This peak is referred to as the undershoot. The negative potential in the undershoot is then corrected by the sodium-potassium pump that re-establishes the gradient that sets the resting membrane potential. One key factor of the action potential that I haven't mentioned is the threshold in voltage that triggers it. The threshold is a very interesting property because a fraction of a millivolt can be the difference between generating an action potential or not. When the cell is initially depolarized, the inward sodium current is balanced by an increase in two outward currents from potassium and the leak channels because their driving force increases as the membrane potential gets more positive. Hence, below threshold, the net current is outward, but at the threshold value, which is always higher than the resting membrane potential, the net current from sodium, potassium and the leak channels is inward which allows more voltage-gated sodium channels to open and depolarize the membrane up to the overshoot. This localized view of the action potential is good to understand, but in my opinion, the more interesting aspect of the phenomenon is how it propagates across the axon. Here, let's consider a longer length of the axon, which is filled with multiple voltage-gated potassium and sodium channels. When the depolarization reaches a sodium channel, it causes a local action potential to occur, which then passively propagates through the axon. The segment that just had an action potential is now in a refractory period, which is characterized by the inactivation of sodium channels and the sustained potassium efflux. During this period, the channels will not answer to any amount of depolarization until they have gone through a hyperpolarization that removes the inactivation motif from the pore. As a result, the refractory period confers directionality of the signal by preventing channels to open again and depolarize the axon in the other direction. Thus, depolarizations only impact and open the channels that are in front that haven't been inactivated. We will shortly see how the refractory period affects signaling between neurons. Now, the passive propagation of the positive charges that have entered the cell as a consequence of voltage-gated sodium channels opening, depolarizes the next local subregion of the axon, such that an action potential fires there as well. This continuous cycle of depolarization and hyperpolarization is passed through the axon up until it reaches the axon terminal. 
Graphically speaking, this self-regenerative signal carries a constant magnitude throughout its propagation and for that reason, the signal is often said to be all or nothing. When we consider two neurons communicating with each other, the refractory period caused by sodium inactivation and potassium efflux affect how the signal is carried through the body. In this simple two-neuron system, let's consider the response from the second neuron after the first signals to it. We will assume that at rest, when the first neuron signals to the second, it is sufficient to trigger an action potential. When that occurs, we can show on our plot that this injection of current produces an action potential that travels across the second neuron. If the first neuron fires an action potential very shortly after the first one, it is possible that the second neuron might not even be able to fire an action potential. This is caused by the fact that all of the voltage-gated sodium channels in the second neuron are inactivated. This state is referred to as the absolute refractory period. In another scenario, if the second action potential is fired a bit later relative to the absolute refractory period, some of the voltage-gated sodium channels will have activated again and will contribute to firing an action potential, but because not as many sodium channels can participate, the magnitude will probably be lesser. The state is known as the relative refractory period. Finally, if the second signal is fired sufficiently beyond the refractory period, the recorded response in the second neuron will be the expected all or none response. This aspect of neuronal signaling is very important because the information in the brain is interpreted in great part through the frequency of action potentials that a neuron receives and sends. And since the refractory period greatly influences that frequency, it is very important to neuronal communication. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.